Um, so we are going to begin our uh, next session, the vision, technology, and electrophysiology. And there is a surprise in uh, this session. We will discover that there is an organ that is called the eye and the retina, and it has to do something with vision. After the first uh, session, if someone just forgot that there is also an eye and retina, and we will begin with the middle cells, Muller cells in the retina, uh, which will be presented by Professor Oliver Perlman from the Technion. Thank you very much, Yossi, for inviting me. And especially you got my curiosity to come when you said, Ido, we need something about the eye and the retina, and so we will not forget it. Uh, therefore, I chose even a, a, a worse topic. I'm not talking about retina neurons, but about uh, glia cells. So it would be even further from the, the brain, but it, tells, it will tell you about uh, visual function and visual pathology in the retina because I'm coming from a medical school from the Technion and somehow the uh, retinal pathology is also important to us uh, for our patients. So I'm going to talk about middle cells and as you s can you hear me without it? You can. I'm always allowed to do one These are either the middle cells and they are very long cells and I'll show you in a minute how they look. They have a, a big variety of them. This is from turtle, these are from different uh, mammals, and this is our topic of the, of the of today talk. Uh, if we look at, oh my god, we need the light. Can you turn on the light? This is a beautiful uh, you know, <coughs> section. But, uh, anyhow, this is the sketch of the retina. Uh, the photoreceptors that are uh, responding to light. Then we have second order neurons, uh, bipolar cells, uh, horizontal cells, amacrine cells, and then the ganglion cells that send their axon to the brain for further uh, processing, information processing that you know all about. It. Uh, so for decades, when the middle cells were, the, were described, these are the middle cells, this they scan, they scan the entire retinal width from what we call the outer limiting membrane to the inner limiting membrane. It's not good. It was much better before. Better before? Yes. So it's either your computer. Good. All right. Now you can go to sleep if you want. It's OK. So you can see here a beautiful section of a Thing. This is the red retina. You can see the Miller cells. These are the Miller cells. All these cells that span the entire length of the retina from the outer limiting membrane. Their processes make the outer limiting membrane at the photoreceptor level, and their end feet make the inner retinal, uh, inner limiting membrane. Again, this is uh, the entire end feet are fused together. And the first uh, idea when people saw this said, aha, these are like biological names. <coughs> Somebody has to, the retina has different sections, different layers, and you have to keep them together. It's like putting pieces of wood together, and you have to name them so they, they will not go apart. So they said that's yes, the first, uh, Don't worry. So, okay, so I'll be here. Nothing goes. Freeze. Okay. All right. Okay. So this was the first uh, idea about, and everybody saw that this is the main function of the mirror. System. That was like a hundred years ago. Uh, with time, they, they discover more and more roles for the middle cells, and eventually, like 20 years ago, they established the glia, the middle, the glia cells uh, journal, which published a lot of uh, papers dedicated to the middle cells because they have a lot of roles. Maintaining them on the status of the extracellular potassium, <coughs> that's exactly like what you need in the brain because there will be no homeocellular potassium activity will stop. Provide retinal neuron with nutrition, 
uptake of and recycling of L-glutamate, uptake of GABA and glycine, modulate neuronal excitability, they produce deceiving, protective against oxidative stress, participate in recycling of visual pigments, and guiding light from the ILM to the photoreceptors. And I'm going to take all, from all these only two roles, and I try to make it uh, to be able to make it because usually I don't speak too much. I'll talk a little bit about uptake and recycling of glutamate, and then more about guiding light from the ILM to the photoreceptors. So if we talk about if we talk about signal trans transmission from the photoreceptors, glutamate is the excitatory transmitter of the retina, like in the brain. Also. The, Remember, the brain is a piece of red, the retina is a piece of the brain. Uh, l like is the excitatory neurotransmitter of the photoreceptors, and it is continuously released in darkness. So there is a very high continuous rate of glutamate release in the dark, and when there is a light uh, stimulus or there is light, it reduces the rate of glutamate release. The conservation of, of glutamate in the synapses reduces because it, there is uptake by glutamate transporters. So when there is, uh, when the concentration of glutamate decreases, the photoreceptors, uh, you can see photoresponses in the second order neurons, in the bipolar cells, and horizontal cells. So in order to take away the glutamate from the extracellular space, we have two types, major two types of uh, glutamate transporters in the uh, in the distal retina and the, in the photoreceptor bipolar cell layer. We have GLT-1, which is located mainly in photoreceptors, horizontal cells, and bipolar cells. And we have GLAT-1 in the middle cells. Now, it's very interesting to see the cycle of glutamate uh, in, the, in the retina. This is the, uh, this is the terminal of the photoreceptor. Let's say the, it looks more like a cone, but let's say this is the and then you have processes of bipolar cells and horizontal cells coming to this ribbon synapse to get to receive the transmitter. And then this is the process of the Miller cell making the outer limiting membrane. Okay, so there is a lot of a close attachment between all those processes. And glutamate, you can see glutamate cycle in glutamate is released in the dark. There is an uptake through GLT1 and then it's released again. So there is a way to release it in a continuous way. The other, the other uh, cycle is glutamate released from the photoreceptors. From the photoreceptors, it, there is an uptake by GLAST1, and this uptake is together with sodium, with sodium ions. And then uh, glutamate synthase is making glutamate into glutamine. Glutamine can transfer back into the photoreceptors, which is becoming back glut glutamate and released again. So there is this cycle. And there is a few uptake by bipolar cells and horizontal cells. I'm not stressing them. For me, it's more interesting this cycle because this is the cycle that allows a continuous release of glutamate in the dark. OK? Now, in order to follow up glutamate release, we need to measure something. We don't measure glutamate. We are more electrophysiologists. We measure the electroretinogram. The electroretinogram is the Retinal response to a, to a slight stimulus. It's like every organ in the body that is based about electrical activity, you can record its activity. Now, here these are the, this is really the electrotelogram that we record. There is a, we record it from the cornea, there is a negative A wave, a positive B wave, and don't look at the C wave, it's not interest. This, uh, this ERG is really a combination of two major uh, components. One, comp one component is called P3 because of historical events I'm not talking about. Uh, but it's called P3. It's a negative going corneal electrical response, which lasts as long as the flash of light is lasting. And this is really the photoreceptors uh, response to light. So the P3 is a, is a, is a sign of light light about your electric activity in the photoreceptors. Then we have P2, which is light evoked response in bipolar cells, mainly on the bipolar cells. And you can see there is a positive corneal, then a steady state, 
and recovery. If you take those two together and sum them, you can get the A wave and the B wave. So when we look in a crude way, because we want to do our uh, long-lasting experiment, which are done on a, uh, on, a, on a live animal, but it's a law. I mean, the animal wakes up, we don't take the eye out, we don't take the retina out. It's an um, animal. If we can record the A wave and the B wave. For us, the A wave is a sign from for photoreceptor activity, the B wave is a sign for second order neurons. Okay, so we can take a L glutamate, inject it into the vitreous, into the eye of a rabbit. We have two eyes, so we inject it into wire, one eye only. This is the injected eye, this is the normal eye. And we look at the two ERG. This is a normal ERG. A small A wave, a big B wave. So we have a electrical activity in the photoreceptors and then in the bipolar cell. However, when we look at the eye injected with L-glutamate, we get a very large, a larger A wave and a much smaller B wave. And the idea is that we block somehow a synaptic activity. How we block it? It's quite simple. We can say that the L-glutamate that is injected is of high concentration. It saturates all or most of the glutamate receptors on the second order neurons. So if you change glutamate release from the photoreceptor by light, there is no change in the, in the level of the second order neuron. So the B wave is cut down, and that's why the A wave grow up, because it's a sum of them. All right? However, if we wait, so this happens about three hours after injection. We know that three hours will take uh, the drug to get to the, outer, to the area of the synapse between the, you know, between the horizontal, between the bipolar cells and uh, photoreceptors. However, if we wait two weeks and we study again this animal, we can see that we get a better response than here. There is an A wave and a B wave. The A wave become, became a little smaller, the B wave became a little larger, but altogether this ERG is much smaller than this one. And we can wait, this is two weeks after, we can wait four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, it doesn't change. So we got a retinal pathology. Somehow the outer retina is not functioning well, it is sort of done. And when then we look at the section of retina, and you can see this is the normal retina from the good eye. These are the nuclei of the photoreceptors. These are the inner uh, nuclear layer of the bipolar cell, mirror, uh, horizontal and, gang and the amacrine, and these are the ganglion cell layer. And if you look at the injected retina, you can see that you don't see much retina. There is some nuclei in the outer nuclear layer, no inner segment, outer segment, most of them are not functioning. There is the death of the ganglion of the inner nuclear layer and almost none of the of the ganglion cell layer. And yes, this retina is definitely damaged compared to this. Okay, so we but we know glutamate is the transporter, is the horizontal, is the photoreceptor transmitter. So we decided, okay, let's go one step further. We go to all excitatory. In uh, amino acid. So we use L glutamate and L aspartate, and then D glutamate and D aspartate. And we measure them three hours after injection and two weeks after injection. And you can see when the, the, when the B wave goes up and the A wave, is, sorry, the A wave go increases and there is no B wave, this is a block transmission. And you can see it with L glutamate the endogenous transmitter, but you can see it also with L-glutamate, uh, l -aspartate. and you can see it also with the glutamate and with the aspartate, which are not supposed to do anything to glutamate transporters. When you wait two weeks, okay, if everything is one, this is the, we, we compare the good eye to the bad eye, you can see there is a sub damage, the B wave is very much, uh, Smaller, the A wave maybe uh, stay the same. The, this is a damaged retina. This is a very much damaged retina. This is a, a very diseased retina. The A wave is gone, uh, it's half. The B wave is gone. And again, the D aspartate is also very good. And that was a puzzle. Why the D isomers are doing such damage? And the, the only thing that 
is common to the L isomers and B isomers is all of them are substrate of the transporters. So they are not from our known physiology. L, the L, L, the L glutamate is the endogenous trans uh, transmitter, and therefore the uh, the receptors on the second order duon are, are specific to L glutamate. But still, we have if you take the D isomers, they are very much uh, effective, and sometimes even more more effective than the L one. So we decided to test what's happening to the. Uh, if we if we if we stop the or inhibit the transporters, okay. So here we inject DHK. DHK is an inhibitor of GLT1, and you can see this is the injected eye. This is the non-injected eye. If you inject uh, DHK, which is an inhibitor of GLT1, the transporter of photoreceptors and bipolar cells and horizontal cells, the ERG is even getting bigger, larger after four hours, and after two weeks, there is no damage. So we guess that GLT-1 is not that important. It's important, but not so much. But if we take THA, which, uh, in, which is a substrate of last one, and it's a, a competitive inhibitor of all the, uh, of L-glutamate, you can see that after four hours, the B wave is gone. There is a complete block of synaptic transmission from the photoreceptor to the bipolar cells. And if we wait two weeks, the ERG is almost gone. So and if we take sections, you can see that the, 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 the injection, in the experimental uh, retina is, is completely damaged, and the other retina is, is very good. So yes, using THA, which is a subset to the last one, not to any, is a, very, it, it's a very toxic, it's a, it's a very effective uh, drug, it's, and it's competitive inhibitor because it's a much higher efficacy or more uh, affinity to the last one. So from here, and this is the, from here we, we conclude that like, like many other um, cases in the body, we have a yin and yang situation. When you have them in the right concentration, in physiological concentration, that they are crucial. When last one is working, last one is the one responsible, mainly responsible, for signal transmission in mammals from photoreceptor to second on the neuron. Last one in the middle cells. So middle cells is a crucial element to allow a transmission of a signals from the from the photoreceptors to the second order neurons, but as long as they are not activated to a, to a high extent. Once you have too much egg glutamate or any other transmitter that is uptake by GLAS1, GLAS1 start to, um, to uptake uh, glutamate plus uh, sodium ions, which then water will follow, uh, mirror cells will swell and they swell, and they have all other function like um, uh, siphoning of potassium, uh, uptake of glycine. So really, the, the entire uh, contribution to retinal function is gone, and the retina will die, and that's what we see. So yes, mirror cells are very important for physiological physiology, but they can contribute to pathology. Okay. And these are the contributors that, uh, yeah, that was his MD thesis. Professor Bo Lai from China who was doing his PhD on another topic, Esther and Professor Matt Lovingston. And of course, this is the experimental end. <laughs> okay. The second row, how much do I have? Ten? Zero. Not two. No, 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 no. Give me five. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Two and five is seven. Okay. <laughs> Some years ago, they found out uh, a group from uh, Leipzig that, for, that middle cells, because of their index of refraction, because of their size, they can serve as biological uh, um, ligands. And uh, 
they have several, we have several assumptions when we saw the paper. According to the paper, Mueller cells and feet cover the entire vitro retinal surface, okay? This is the inner retinal membrane. It's really a membrane. So the end feet of the middle cells cover almost the entire. They are very tight. And they form the inner. Each middle cell, when you look at what it contacts in the, in the photoreceptor level, it contacts a single cone. And we know the troughs are located between middle cells. And now we have a puzzle. If um, mirror cells guide, they collect all the light that falls on the inner, on the retinal surface and guide it through their optic fiber uh, properties to the photoreceptors, to the single cones, what will happen with, for the ro to the rods that are in between um, those light guides? they will not get light. So how can we have such a good uh, rod vision at night? It's mainly rod vision, and then how much light is getting to the rods? So we decided to test, first of all, to test these two, these two uh, assumptions. And, okay, so I've got some fact. We took a, a piece of retina of a, of guinea pig, you put it on a comfortable microscope. By doing autofluorescence, we know about where the outer segments of the photoreceptors are, so we uh, guide our measurement, measurement of light, about uh, 50, uh, 10, 50, 20 micron up, so they'll be not disturbed by this. And now we took section of five micron sections and went up all the way, we had the 588 nanometer light shining diffusing in the retina, and you can see hot spots. And we, the computer start to do the uh, put them together, and what you can get, you can get these structures. Okay, this is the hot spots in each level connected together, and these are look they look like tubes, and the only structure in the mammalian retina is a tube or mirror cells. So yes, Miller cells probably act like tubes. The second experiment was we took the, again the retina of the uh, of the guinea pig, and we did we reconstructed those tubes by going up on a like like we I described here. But we also um, used the antibody that uh, stay in live uh, cones. And then these are the green spots. <laughs> and you can see that those tubes reach the green spots almost. We find about 90% of the tubes reaching the green spots. And also you can see them here. So yes, the idea that the tubes, the mirror cells reach, uh, touch uh, the cones is quite good. So now we went back and asked what's happening. And we took those hot spots, that I show you, that's how we build the mirror cell tube, and we start to do transmission uh, um, spectrum. So we shine light from 400 nanometer to 700, and we measure in the, in the hot spot, in the level of the photoreceptor, how much light of this wavelength is uh, uh, transmitted, and you can see the, this is the spectrum. These are of hot, 10 hotspots in one retina, and when we, when we put them together, we get uh, this average. So there is a peak in about 580, 560 nanometer. And now we, take, we took five retinas and did exactly the same. And you can see these are five retinas, and this is the average of the five retinas. When we subtract it from, the, from our total illumination, this is the illumination in the, in the surrounding, sorry, of the, in the surrounding of the hot spots. So this is what is leaking out from the mirror cells. Now we have this, this as you see, we made the, it was done by two phys, by a physics student and by my student. The physics student was my PhD student, and the other one was my PhD. 
and they he created the model based based on uh, Helmholtz optic uh, assumption. Whatever, don't ask me. I'm not. It's far from me. And this is the result of the model based on the uh, index of refraction of the middle third index of refraction refraction of the surrounding. Uh, size of mineral cells, everything, this is what we get. And here you can see there is a very good co oops, correlation. And here also there is a very good correlation, what you expect. Now, from, for human, we cannot do it. So we, do, we did only models. And this is knowing the index of refraction of mineral cells of humans and surrounding retina. And knowing size and all, all, all the, all the optic parameters that we need. This is the, the, the spectrum of the, the transmission light, and this is the spectrum of the leaking light. This is what the middle cell will transfer to the uh, cone. This is what is leaking out to the rods. And if you compare it to the three cones, type, type of cones of the, middle, of the human, you can see the transmission fit very well the red cone almost 80% of the green cone and a little bit much less to the blue cone. In the other one, if you take the spectrum of the surround, you can see that the spectrum of the road is, the peak is not that much damaged. The damage will be only here, or the, the need. So we did some correlation, how much, how much more light arrived or is absorbed by the cones due to uh, this property, this wavelength dependent uh, optic guide properties of the mirror cells. And you can see for red cone, you get about eight times more light. For green cones, about seven and a half. For blue cones, about four. And the rods loses about 50%, which is not much. But, and this is my last slide. No. When you do this, uh, <coughs> This uh, modeling, this uh, optical modeling for humans, for the humans, it turns out that the uh, peak of the spectrum, the transmitted peak of the transmitted light, shifts to long wavelengths when the when the width, the diameter of the mirror cells increases, and to short one when it decreases. Now think about it. So before, when the retina is in darkness. There's a lot of glutamate release by photoreceptors, and there's a lot of glutamate uptake together with sodium by mirror cells. So they bound to swell a little bit, not much. We don't know how much, nobody measured it, but we couldn't, so we couldn't find data. But if we just imagine that from 1.2 micron under regular light condition, they swell by, by 0.1 micron in width, the peak will go from 560 nanometer to 595 nanometers, which means less light is transmitted of the short wavelengths, and more light will be uh, uh, leak, will leak to the surrounding. Therefore, we think that under darkness condition, when the road vision is most necessary, they don't lose 50 percent; they lose much more less. They lose maybe somewhere between five and eight. And that will allow us to have a very good, still a very good uh, road vision. This last part of the, is all, ah, come on, not again. Well, I have to thank uh, uh, Ami, Amichel Labin, who was a PhD student from physics. He did most of the modeling. And uh, Shadi Safuri was an empty PhD. MD PhD of mine. And uh, this is Amichai Labin and Eros Vibak from Physics that collaborated here. And this was published in Nature Communication. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I missed it. It was very nice. Very exciting.